I'm really honored and appreciative of being here, especially among so many like friends and colleagues in the San Antonio show. It's, I'm psyched to be here. So um, I must admit that when I was first asked as a sound artist to come and talk about music or sound that's inspired me, I was a little perplexed and kind of not really knowing what to talk about. There was a lot of possibilities. Um, I've hosted a radio show, as Michael said, for 11 years. Uh, care to you, I feel like I could talk about that. Or how my passion for DJing is actually what got me started in the arts. Uh, this is a photo of <laughs> my brother and I DJing a gig in Austin a few years ago. We usually have three rules. Play fly ass music, mix it flawlessly, and then dress accordingly. <laughs> or I could talk about how happy I am to carry on the long tradition of visual artists who make work and are in bands. So actually the band I'm in, we're re releasing our album tomorrow in San Antonio. So I'm gonna head back and <laughs> do that tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think the one thing that I, no, I didn't really wanna talk about was to sort of do a straight ahead um, artist slide talk kind of thing. So instead of talking about my work and what it all means, I'd like to speak tonight on a topic that I think, uh, think about many times, and probably most every day, and that's how do I make work? It's an interesting question, because I feel as artists, we're often asked and busied with the idea of what is my work about? Sorry, I have to click twice for the videos. Um, and as an artist who works in a wide range of medium and formats, I'm constantly thinking about making work and looking for ideas and inspiration. As the ideas start to accumulate, sketchbooks will fill up. So there's a random sketchbook page. There's a weird sketch there that eventually turned into <laughs> this equally weird piece uh, from 2017 called Going On Going. It was this giant clock tower I built. And you know, somehow those sketches end up turning into exhibitions. And as these ideas and works accumulate over time, I often wonder, where do these individual pieces and ideas fit within my overall body of work? Are my efforts cohesive? Do they need to be? And is the work I'm making adding up to an overall artistic vision? And I feel like it's not just myself asking me these questions. Often in studio visits, I'm asked, Justin, why don't you do just sound? Or, hey, video piece is pretty cool, why don't you just do those? Or, do all of your sculptures have to have sound? And so it brings me back to the question, do I need a framework to fit all of my efforts within? Does it need to be a cohesive artistic vision? And after years of asking that question and digging through my work looking for the con connecting conceptual thread, it's only recently that I realized that I've been asking myself the wrong question. This artistic framework that I'm looking for and talking about is actually just a simple form. It's a form that's arrived at by adding up all of the pieces and the work I do, like wine bottles in a wine rack. And what I'm really searching for is not a framework of meaning, or to answer my earlier question, what is my work about, but actually I'm looking for a way to make work. And if you will, a unifying creative model that I can apply to whatever idea or challenge comes my way. If I find out how to do that, then yes, all of the pieces that I make, regardless of medium, will be of a similar kind, and they'll merge into an overall artistic vision. And those bottles of ideas will fill the rack in a cohesive and a thoughtful way. So tonight, I wanna to share with you one model of creativity that I keep coming back to in my own work. Is it my unifying theory? Maybe. If all the combined power in physics can't find one, then I may not be able to find mine either. But this creative model does resonate deeply with all, within all of my work and is a model that I like to call the artist as synthesizer. The definition I'm using for synthesizer is to create concrete or abstract form by combining and arranging different parts and elements. Hmm, that didn't really work very well, did it? Let's see if that'll come back. Oh, come on, be cool, yes. <laughs> so yeah, to create concrete or abstract form, abstract form by combining and arranging different parts and elements. 
The model of artist as a synthesizer only came to me a few years ago, and the source was, from all things, my modular synthesizer. Shocking. Um, but within the structure of the modular synthesizer, I found a better way for understanding not only how I make my work, but actually a different way to engage with the world. So how does that work, and what do I mean by that? I'll start technically. I've designed my Eurorack, which is what that is called and this is called. It's a type of a format of synthesizer. I've designed that to not do anything until it receives some sort of incoming signal. So the, the system will lie dormant until it receives an input of some sort. That input has varied greatly for me. Sometimes it's a field recording. When I play in the band, it's an instrument. When I work with video, it's whatever I have the camera pointed at. The input basically could be any sound or image that I capture or stream. I then take that input, listen to it, I decode it, and then I let its information tell other things within the system what to do. Some of those things might filter the sound or video, some might resonate with it, others can hammer along to it, some can color the sound, others might shape it, and at the end, that signal, and at the end it will come out of the signal chain. The sound or image that does come out will sound familiar or look familiar, but will be transformed in some sort of way. So transformed how? And more importantly, why? I think each synthesizer may answer that question differently. I answer the questions this way. By transforming everyday sounds, images, and objects, it's my hope to create work that causes a mental or physical pause a break caused by an unexpected sensorial shift that allows the viewer to see the subject with fresh eyes and hear with clear ears. The goal for my artwork is to try to re-inject a sense of wonder and engagement into the things that we take for granted or are tired of. Let me show you a couple of examples. Why do birds sound like car alarms now? This is a public art project in a downtown park that was commissioned by the city of San Antonio. The piece, or in this piece, I spent several months recording the sounds of the park and the city around it. I then processed and transformed the recordings to give the natural sounds a little more mechanical feel and the mechanical sounds a little more natural feel. These sounds were then played back on a three channel system along a series of six speakers in the park. You can kind of see these sort of wave-shaped speakers, like those metal enclosures there. It's running along the Sasekia at a park. Um, yeah, it's six speakers park. In an urban environment, sounds stack on top of each other. Often things sound like other things. That's the title, Why Do Birds Sound Like Car Alarms? Frequently you kind of get those things kind of blurring and sonically. So my goal in adding to this auditory confusion was to draw attention to the soundscape that's happening around you. Um, to stop here and ask yourself, was that a bird? It doesn't really sound like a bird I've heard before. Or why does that bus going by sound like the ocean? A more recent example is a piece that's currently up in one of the city's uh, tricentennial exhibitions.
For this project, each artist was given a year within the city's history. My year was 1813, and the work centered around a specific battle that took place along the Rocio Creek on the east side of San Antonio. During my research, I found maps of the battlefield and diary entries from the soldiers who fought in the battle. This piece is actually two different bodies of work coming together. The first piece, or the first piece is a series of solar prints, where I'll go to a spot, sit, listen, and write down everything that I hear. Once I've filled the glass panel, I then press it to solar paper and expose the words I've written there on the spot with whatever sunlight is around. So the print is a type of recording. It's an audio document without sound, and it also records the natural light that was there in the space. So I traveled to the site of the battle many times, taking with me my solar print kit, photocopies of soldiers' journals who fought in the battle, and the audio recorder. I sat where the battle took place. It's now a freeway. I listened and I wrote down what I heard. During this process, a sound or event would happen that would bring to mind something that one of the soldiers had written in their diary. So I would interject those words with the sounds that I was hearing at there in the space. Um, so then I would sit, keep listening and writing, and then once I finished, I exposed the print there on the battlefield freeway with sounds and words from both 1813 and from 2017. The second body of work in this piece is found in the objects. The styrofoam, the can, the earth, and the sounds you are hearing were all gathered from the creek and its banks. I've made several pieces where the sound of something will inhabit a different something. I do this by using my modular synthesizer to filter the sound down to a limited range of frequencies. I then play that filtered sound through a transducer which is basically like a speaker without a cone. And that transducer will be placed on the object until it will activate at a very specific resonant frequency. So you can filter these sounds down until the object will vibrate with the sound of whatever you're putting it through. So I, I did that with this piece. The styrofoam, the sort of low freeway sounds that you hear are coming from the styrofoam piece. And then the water sounds are coming from the aluminum can. So it's a sort of stereo duet, <laughs> in essence. This sort of synthesizing or creative model is not a new way of working. It has its precedence all over the place. In Dada's collage and games, and John Cage's ideas that music should be open and accepting to outside sounds and noises, also his steadfast dedication to collaboration. Brian Eno, here we see his liner notes for discrete music. I'll read the first two paragraphs. Since I have always preferred making plans to executing them, I have gravitated towards situations and systems that once set into operation could create music with little or no intervention on my part. That is to say, I tend towards the roles of planner and programmer and then become an audience to the results. And finally, sample-based musics hip-hop and electronic music especially. Genres that taught us to take pre-existing sounds and music and merge them with cheap technology to make those our instruments for creativity. So even though the artist as a synthesizer model has its roots in the past, I do feel its core principles are still timely today. Actively listening or waiting for an input requires patience and presence. It is by its nature a collaborative and receptive dynamic. To take a signal, listen to it, learn from it, and then alter the signals of the familiar into something transformative takes a critical understanding and also a gentle hand. It may require actually doing very little or having to quickly improvise a solution to a wild incoming signal. Patience, presence, collaboration, critical understanding, empathy, improvisation. These are words that can carry meaning to many disciplines and creative pursuits outside of art. And I totally think this way of working and processing information can even become political in a social climate such as ours. So that's my model for the artist as a synthesizer. What started out as a search for what my work is about has led me more importantly to the question 
how do I make work? Developing a method of creativity that will help me to make work given any input or endeavor that comes my way. It does bring to mind the question though, what if no one or thing is willing to give an input signal? In our sensorially saturated world, I don't think that will happen. But if it did, I guess I'll know what Frank Drake and the SETI scientists feel like. I'll just be there, present, and listening. So that was the model for creativity, thanks. I thought maybe if I could share a couple of examples of how I've used this model recently in my work, in addition to the other two. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take those too. So I'll let this play for a second, and then I'll explain it. piece is called two tracks and in this case the input signal for um, this process was actually my video I just filmed the train that goes by my house lots of times a day <laughs> and uh, I, we live right on the railroad track so but an interesting thing happens if you take a video signal and plug it into an audio input what you will get is a series of lines that will happen so those lines are indications of how much visual information is kind of happening. And then if you take the sound from the video, and you plug it into a video input, you will get um, the lines to open and close with the density of image. So it's basically this sort of idea of the trains, there's two tracks there and there's actually two trains going by. But if you cross the audio and video signals together, what you get is the sound being generated by the video, and the video is generating the sound. So those two things kind of flip. So in this case, that sort of model of like taking an input um, and then processing it through the system worked fairly well, I think. So this is that piece. What you're actually seeing on the left-hand side too is that's why there's two microphones. It's being processed, obviously. I'm sure you've figured it out through the video synthesizer here as I'm kind of talking. So there's like two channels. Essentially, there's this channel that will respond in some ways um, to my voice. And then there's this channel, which will also should respond as well, the blue lines. Those two things happen together. Let's go to another example, one that's audio-based. So I played some sounds from that project, Why Do Birds Sound Like Car Alarms? So I thought I'd maybe talk about that for a second. When I was recording the sounds, and I, I spend a lot of time field recording, uh, I, a lot of times I don't really know what to do with the sound yet. I just have a giant library of recorded sounds. So I thought I'd play for you what the sound sounds like dry, and then maybe you can get a chance to kind of hear what something might sound like in that transformative method. What I'm really interested in with sound, especially um, in the urban environment is, as I was kind of talking about, that audio blurring where one thing sounds like something else and you might not understand where it's coming from or how it's being generated. Mockingbirds are a great example, you know, like a bird that sort of copies the sound of other things happening around it or grackles, things like that. So this is the grackle sound dry. We, we all know that sound. <laughs> so then this is it being processed. And 
me see if I can turn it up just a little bit. So in that piece, why do birds sound like car alarms now? There was six channels, and so one of the channels would have the regular sound of the grackle playing. One channel has an altered sound such as this, and this will change over time. So the goal is to put it to transform it in some sort of way where there's a familiarity, where there's something recognizable, but changed and sort of switched. And as I was saying, I'm always kind of hoping for that pause to be like well, what is that or why is that happening and I think once that break kind of happens and you're open to seeing like oh wow um, where is it coming from or why and you start to notice the things around you a little more so that's just an example there then I thought I would just talk about um, one more <laughs> this was a piece I'd recorded this sound of really random set of occurrences but there was these birds in a chimney and I recorded them because they sounded cool. And then I had an opportunity to be in a show where it was in a house and there was an old fireplace there. And I thought, oh, wow, wouldn't it be cool to like put birds back in this fireplace? It wasn't the same one, but so, so I made this crazy fireplace screen. And um, if you can kind of see, it's basically like two birds and a UFO beaming down. Um, and they're kind of sitting on this LP looking shape. But anyway, I mean, <laughs> I made this soundtrack and altered the bird sounds. So the piece of wood is being vibrated by, the trans by a transducer. So essentially the fireplace screen turns itself into a speaker. So it vibrates with the sound. So um, let me uh, play you what that sounds like. So that's the signal dry. Strange sparrows have made a nest in my family. <laughs> Seemed appropriate. <laughs> So all the sounds you hear are being generated by the sound of those sparrows. Typically you can take that sound and you can generate specific kinds of information from it and then that information triggers other things within the system so you kind of can route the sound and get it to do a lot of different things. I'll fast forward a little bit. It gets really freaky here for a second. So there, the sound's just been like filtered down to just the lower frequencies and it's kind of, you can still hear the same sort of cadence though. It's like a 45 minute piece. So, I mean, I recorded a lot. <laughs> I will not subject you to that, to that. And I thought maybe I'll just talk about one more piece. Sometimes, you know, it's inputs that come from other places too. So. Um, my good friend Dario lives here in Houston, and I collaborate with him frequently on different projects and stuff, but he gave me uh, the sort of strange request at one point to compose a score to be played on that violin up there by the man down there. Um, who <laughs> so it's a sort of soldier legless, you know, just the the soldier's left with just his legs. He has like this random crazy violin that Dario makes, you know, out of like all these battlefield materials. And then so I had the difficult task of trying to imagine what the man on the bottom right would play on the instrument on the top, and then make a score for it. So I'd written this score, and you can kind of see it here. It's just, this is the front cover that Dario designed, but like the score behind is this sort of ode to the soldier. Um, and it was a great story because 
I was spent a ton of time kind of working on it and trying to figure out what it was going to be. And then if we printed it out and Dario made the paper and <laughs> made the print and it's never been played and it's never been heard before. <laughs> I spent weeks like working on it and I was like, okay, like, are you ready to hear it? And he's like, no, I don't, I don't want to hear it. It's like, we're not going to do anything with it. I'm just going to print the music. And I was like, actually, it's kind of perfect. Like we, d we don't, we don't need to hear it. So it's like one of those interesting things like that, that kind of input and that process, that collaborative process where, you know, you get something and you're not exactly sure what you're going to do with it. But, um, the way it comes out at the end can be quite different. So um, I think that's it. That's what I just wanted to kind of share that idea and model today. It's like a, just a lot I've been thinking about lately. So if anyone has any questions or comments, I'm happy to field those. Or if not, I really appreciate you hanging out with me.